Dear Lord, I pray you bless our class tonight. We're going to discuss somebody that uh, will remind us of ourselves, I hope. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will open our minds and hearts to what you have for us. We're not just here filling time. We're trying to impact people's lives. And I pray that... Um, Somebody in the room tonight will have their heart open to this. I don't expect everyone to, but I would pray that some would. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many folks know the story of Jonah and the whale? Just Jonah and the whale, those two, just put your hand up. Let me see. So we've got uh, half, maybe half, okay. So let's uh, talk about Jonah in the belly of the whale. I'm in Jonah chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading so you can follow along. And it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But, that's a bad word to have right in the middle of a, a directive by God, isn't it? God said, do it, but Jonah not rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and there he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and he went down into the ship to go unto, the, unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, that just doesn't work. Have you ever tried to run away from God? Yes. You can't get away. You know, I don't care how far you go. It doesn't matter. He's uh, got a very long reach. And it said, and we know what's going on here now. We got Jonah running from God, don't we? Yeah. Did you ever do that? Yeah. Okay, so here's what it says. And Jonah went to Joppa. And by the way, that's right at um, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, right in Israel. It's going out to the Med. And when, if you go due west, you can end up in... Portugal, which is the other side of the Mediterranean, right, in, as you enter the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, Jonah says, and he paid the fare. <laughs> so he's going down, right? And it cost him something to do this. Isn't that funny? That's kind of uh, relating to that, are you? Every time you go down, guess what? It cost you something. And uh, it cost you more and more and more. And sometimes the price is brutal. It just costs so much. And he went down into the ship. And he went down. And he, he's going down. But it says in verse number uh, 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the ship. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. So... What's going on? God's, mad. God's chasing Jonah, right? It says the Lord prepared a wind. Now, was this just a storm? That... No, no, no. This one was from God. And he's going after Jonah, and he's going to try to teach Jonah something. And uh, so it says, verse uh, 5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. How many gods are there? Well, there's only one. These guys got confused, right? And cast forth the wares that were in the ship under the sea to lighten it. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was fast asleep. So he wasn't even aware. Look. He was in a coma. He wasn't even aware that his life had affected those around him. Ever been there? The, the, the real question is, did you care? Not much, you know. Just It's kind of unfortunate that you're hooked with me. But it's just, I know it stinks to be you. but So the shipmates 
came to him and they said unto him, well, uh, what means, the, uh, what are you sleeping? Arise, call upon God. If so be that God uh, will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, one, uh, every one of us, fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. You know what that means? They, dis they were rolling dice to see who was the, uh, who was it? Who, somebody brought this calamity on. Who was it? And it showed up as Jonah. Now, do you think God had anything to do with that? The uh, casting of lots and how it pointed to Jonah. So, I mean, God's, this, this is a whole experience that's directed by God. And it's going to get bad. God's going to do something in Jonah's life. And it's going to get bad in order for him to accomplish it. And I just know that, 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 that the more stubborn you are, the worse it gets. I just know that's the way it works. God said, go to Tarshish, and he said, Nineveh, and he said, but Jonah said, no, I'm not going down there. And that's when things start getting hinky in your life. When God tells you to do something and you don't do it, he doesn't just go, oh, isn't that cute? Then said they unto them, Tell us, we pray, for whose cause this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What's your country? Who are your people? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made this sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceeding afraid. I would think so. He said, look, here's the deal, man. I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet of God. He wants me to go that way, and I'm not doing it. I'm going that way. <clears throat> and they went, oh, look at what you've done. Look what you've done. Then the men were exceeding fearful, and they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he was fled from the presence of the Lord because he told him. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea is a tempest. And he said to them, Well, you've got to take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest has come upon you. Now that's pretty interesting observation on Jonah's part. He recognized that he was going through some spiritual growth. We're having a little growth spurt. Right now his life's a mess, and guess what it is? It's a growth spurt. God's trying to teach him something. And by the way, I've got to tell you this. You n uh, Gordon knows that you never learn up here on the mountaintop. Nothing ever grows on the mountaintop. It only grows in the valley where the things get low, where the struggles are. Up here on the mountaintop, there's no grass up there. It all grows down. The growth takes place in the valley. And sometimes if you're not in the valley, God's got to make a valley for you just to get you where you need to be. And here's Jonah. He's learning something. I know that for my sake, the Lord has done this requires hardship. When I was in the uh, high school, I remember I was a basketball player. I know I don't look like I look like I ate one now, but I was a basketball player. And so I, first day out, here's the coach. He says, okay, everybody, practice this. Here's the drill. Do this. Do that. Okay, so we're having fun shooting baskets. And then at the end of the practice, he said, okay, everybody, 50 laps. And I said, all right, so we started counting laps, and we're going round and around. Fifty is a lot of laps around the gym. You know? Here we go, and, and I'm starting to get winded, and, and everybody's tongue's hanging out, you know. And after a while, well, the real problem wasn't that day. The real problem was the next day because I couldn't lift my legs. I remember our school had one step up. And all the basketball players came to school that day walking like this. And if I could just get my leg, uh, oh, uh, just that one lousy step, my legs were killing me. My legs were killing me. And that after school, he went to basketball practice. You know what the coach said? 
50 laps. He said it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And guess what happened? Legs got stronger. After a while, it quit hurting. I went, what? How cool is that? I must have been out of shape. Go figure, right? Here's what I'm saying to you. If there's no pain, there's no gain. And that works in the spiritual world, too. That works in the spiritual world. God wants to teach you something. And if you're like Jonah and said, no, then it's going to cost you more than if you said yes. Simple as it. Because you need to learn. And God is an awesome father and he knows how to deal with all that, right? Verse number 13, nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the boat to the land, but they could not for the sea wrought and the tempest against them. Therefore, they cried unto the Lord. Now, now we got them praying to God. We beseech you, O Lord. We beseech. I mean, they're convinced that God's God now, right? He can control the wind. And they said, let us not perish for this man's sake. Lay not upon this innocent blood, for the Lord has done it as it pleased him. They didn't want to throw him over. He gave them the clue, throw me overboard and it'll be all right. And it says, so, verse 15, they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. It's like a plop, plop, fizz, fizz, you know. It just calms everything. Jonah was like a big Alka-Seltzer. He just <laughs> dropped him into the Mediterranean, and it just went, oh, thank you very much. That's exactly what we were looking for, right? Look at 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. I like that. They became believers, it looks like, doesn't it? I mean, they went, whoa. If your God can do what just happened... He's real. And I want to tell you something. Can I tell you this? God is real. <clears throat> We're not just making up religious stuff. God's real, man. I mean, he does things. I mean, he does some serious things. He helps people. He can do incredible things. He can change your life. Even Satan knows that. Satan said to Jesus at the temptation, well, why don't you hear stone, change this stone into bread if you be the son of God? And what he said, because it's written that he, you, you know, even Satan knows that God can change things. Even Satan knows that Jesus can change bread into stone. Stone into bread, either way you want, doesn't matter. He can do that. And he can take a stony heart Turn it into something awesome. He's a changer. And I think that pain is God's tool of grace. That's what I think. I think pain is God's best tool. Period. How about love? Oh, that's why he's doing it. You know, it says in the Old Testament Proverbs, if, you hate, if a father spares the rod, he hates his son. He's not going to teach him any discipline. He's just going to let him grow up like he wants to, right? Verse 17 of chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared. Now wait a minute. That's the second time we see God preparing. So first thing he did was he prepared a storm. Now he's preparing, uh, he's preparing a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now it says fish here, but when Jesus talked about it in the New Testament, he said even as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, even so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So he said, there's a sign for you. If you want a sign, there's a sign. So you can see how it works. So what we have here is God preparing stuff. God working on Jonah. And uh, what an incredible experience. By the way, so he's in the belly of the whale. Did you ever see the, 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 the uh, story of Pinocchio? Yeah. Did you ever see that? Did you ever wonder about, uh, uh, jo here's Pinocchio, and he, every time he tells a lie, his nose gets bigger. Remember that? And he's got these 
guys that are always trying to get him into trouble. You ever had that in your life? Guys trying to get you into trouble. And you know, every time you get in trouble, something happens, something bad happens. And in, jo and in Pinocchio's case, guess what? He ended up getting swallowed by a whale. Where do they come up with ideas like that? It's not interesting. You ever think of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? What happened? She bit a poison apple. And she died. Who came up with that? Garden of Eden? Right? And she didn't come back alive again until this Prince of Peace came and kissed her. It looks like all Pinocchio ever wanted. Remember how the story ended? All he ever wanted was to be born again. He was a puppet. He didn't want to be a puppet. He wanted to be a real boy. And this light came from heaven. Where do you come up with stuff like that? Pretty imaginative, isn't it? Well, if you read the Bible, it's full of stuff like that. Now the Lord had prepared. A so here's what I'm going to tell you about this. This is judgment. This is God judging Jonah's rebellion. Not mean judgment. Growing and developing judgment. There's a difference between chastisement and discipline. Discipline is designed to create a disciple. It says in Hebrews 12, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It says if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're, you're bastards and you're, you're not sons. You didn't really get, you, God's not really not your father. So we've got judgment going. So what's in the belly of the whale? Well, so far, we've got judgment. In the belly of the whale, judgment. In the belly of the whale, growth. We've got stuff going on here. It's not just a bad ride. This is a learning experience. And by the way, would you expect anything less from God? I mean, if I say no to God, would you expect him to say, oh, how cute? You know, you see these little kids, no, oh, no, no, you got to do this. No, I'm not going to do it. Oh, isn't that cute? No, it's not. It's rebellion. I remember my kids, when they were small, I wouldn't let them say no to me. I say do something. I, I, you say no to me. Oh, that just kind of stood my hair up on the back of my head. I didn't like that. I didn't like my kids telling me no when I told them to do something. Now, they may not do it, I, but I didn't like the word no. <clears throat> That's the way God is. I remember my daughter one day saying no. <laughs> My daughter was like uh, 15 months older than my son, Josh. Anybody know my son, Josh? So he, my son, Josh, was in his little crib thingy, you know, with the walker around. You, it's got a little shelf on it and the wheels on it, and you walk around. And, and so he had some toys on there, and she was older than him. So she ran by, and she knocked all the toys off just to be mean on her way by. I said, oh, no, no, you've got to go pick those toys up. She said, no. I went, oh, no, no, this isn't going to work. You've got to pick those toys up. No, I don't feel good. I said, well, I don't care. It's going to get worse, you know, but you're going to pick those toys up. And no, I'm not picking them up, you know. And she started crying, Mama, Mama, yeah, you know. I said, that's not going to work. That's the way God is. God's not going to let you tell him no and smile at you. He's going to keep the pressure on until you tell him yes. A great fish, and here he is, three days and three nights, and oh my gosh, what are we doing down there? Well, look at chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. I would think he did. I mean, you got nothing but time on your hands down there, right? You, 
three days in the and he began to pray and so what we and by the way there's times in your life when you have what we call serious prayer you know not just praying oh, that's nice I hear them in there and they recite the Lord's Prayer I wonder if they even know what it means what does it mean thy kingdom come what does it mean thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that means I'll tell you what it means are you ready for this how does it how does in heaven God is God and in order for him to be God on earth he has to be in charge of you that's how thy will be done on earth it, it happens in me it happens in me I have to, it has to start right here I can't change the world but I can change me oh <sighs> So here we have serious prayer. And he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of, out of, the belly of hell, cried I. And you heard my voice. He thought he's in hell, didn't he? You ever been there? Thought you were in hell? Man, this is hell. This is, I mean, I can't, this, my life can't get any worse. It just, it's all, I'm, it's. The real trick is crying unto God out of a heart that means it. For you have made me, verse 3, cast into the deep uh, of the midst of the sea, and the floods can pass me about. All the billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I will cast out of my sight, but yet I will look again toward, toward thy holy temple. Well, what's going on here? Well, guess what's happening? This guy's about to repent. What you think? <laughs> The waters can pass uh, me about even to the soul. And the depths close me round about. And the weeds wrapped about my head. I went down into the bottoms of the mountains. And the earth with her bars. I think that's the bones of this ship, right? Were about me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from corruption. O oh, Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. I bet he did. I remembered the day that I told him no. You know, that kind of gets your attention, get swallowed by a whale, wouldn't it? I wonder what it smells like in the belly of a whale. It's got to be nasty, doesn't it? It's got to be fishy, at least fishy, right? Whale bile. <coughs> Verse 8. Verse 7, and my soul fainted, but I remember the Lord and my prayer came into me uh, unto thy holy temple that you observe lying vanities, forsake their own mercy. But I sacrifice unto thee but with the voice of thanksgiving, and I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And here's what I want you to know about that. Repentance is the only sensible way. To process unrighteousness. Man, you gotta change things. You gotta change things. Keep doing what you're doing, you know what happens. You keep getting what you're getting. I have a brother that's stubborn. I wasn't stubborn. I was the third child. My number two was stubborn. He was stubborn. Number one liked to fight dad, and that never turned out good. Number two would just wouldn't do what he said. And uh, he, man, I mean, my bro when we, we ever get a licking, ever, you ever get one? I go to the basement. Well, I, what? Those are scary words. Go to the ba bad stuff happened in the basement. I didn't like the basement, man. It was down there. It was dark, and and then it was it was all right until until the judge came down. You know, he judged us. And I, I, I was quick to cry, man. I know what he wants. He wants tears. I gave him tears. My brother didn't give him tears. My brother gave him attitude. Yeah, that didn't turn out good. Wait a minute, I just described your life. I will sacrifice. So we've got some serious repentance going on here. By the way, 
Here's what it says, verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. Listen to this next phrase. I will pay that I have vowed. So did you ever promise God stuff when you're really down low? What did you promise him? Uh, so here's, here's the deal. You don't promise him something you're not going to give him. Because when, the, when it's dark, you're willing to promise anything, aren't you? But then the daylight comes and you've got to pay up. Oh, Lord, if you just get me out of this, I'll, I'll become a missionary. I don't know. What do you want me to do? I'll do anything you want me to do. Just get me out of this. Ever say that to God? Well, he's, it's payday. He's expecting you to keep your promise to him. I, I, he's God. I think maybe you ought to take a little inventory and say, what are the things I've ever promised God? I wonder if I should pay up. And the Lord spoke unto Jonah. And the Lord spoke unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry ground. Wow. Wow. So God talked to a whale, right? So God talked to the wind, caused the wind to blow. God talked to the whale, caused the whale to pick up Jonah. God talked to the whale again, caused the whale to vomit out Jonah. Have you ever been in the belly of the whale? I think you're in it. And God, because Jonah repented... Had him barfed out. I've always thought puked out is puked on, man. That'd be a nasty deal, wouldn't it? I wonder if Jonah smelled. You ever? Let me ask you this. Did you ever get to where you just didn't like your own odor? You smelled, hadn't had a bath in how long, and you just stunk because of your habit. You just stunk because of the way you were behaving. You stunk around the people around. You couldn't get a job because you go to work and you stink. I think this was written about you. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to change the name. Verse 3, or chapter 3, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, here's what I like about this. A second chance. Now, the question is, has Jonah learned his lesson? I would think he did, didn't he? I, I would think, and by the way, I don't know how far down into the ship, how far down into the belly of the whale, how far down into the sea he had to go, but I do know that his pathway and rebellion from God took him down. And what do they say? you got to hit bottom, right? And when you do, then what happens? Well, maybe, just maybe, God will say, all right. <clears throat> Let's see if you learned anything. Arise, go to Nineveh, he said, that great city, and preach to it. By the way, I don't know of any person in the Bible that ever got it right the first time. Everybody had to have a second go at it, mostly. The only guy that never probably had a significant failure was Joseph. But when you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it's talking about the hall of faith. I call it the hall of Pharaohs. I'm sorry, the hall of failures. Because everybody in there had some kind of failure. Abraham was a man of faith, great faith. Well, Abraham pimped out his wife for crying out loud. What kind of deal is that, you know? And David was a, a man after God's heart. Yeah, but he... Oh, my gosh. Every one of them had a failure in their life, but I think it's a learning curve. Uh, you know, did it ever occur to you that God never did this? <gasps> Look what they've done. Well, God knows who we are. God knows us. God knows you probably better than you know you. He knows what it's going to take to turn you. You may not yet. No, not until you've 
paid the fare. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. I bet he did. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and he said, oh yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Right? So we have Nineveh. Now what is this place? It's a great city. Right now today it would be in the place that we would call Baghdad. Or another modern name for Right across the river is Mosul. It's been on the news recently. The uh, ice, uh, 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 ISIL took Mosul, and now we, we've taken it back, and it's destroyed. But right across the river is a place called Nineveh. It's on the Tigris River. It's right in the middle of Iraq today. It's one of the, that region of the world is the second most mentioned place in the Bible by many different names, Assyria, Babylon, and uh, the like. Mesopotamia in, in uh, archaeology we call it the Fertile Crescent. That's where life began. That's where the Garden of Eden was down at the south end of that. I mean that's a famous place. But these people were wicked. <laughs> Everybody's wicked. If you notice that, this world's, I, I'm getting tired of it. I'm thinking about leaving. <laughs> well, it's doable. I mean, how, how bad can this place get before God just pours out fire and brimstone on us, right? And Jonah went in that city, and here he is now, and he's, uh, he's uh, verse number five, and, and, uh, verse four, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, listen to this, they believed God. Wow. I don't know why. Jonah made a message. They listened to it. And they believed. And you know, I've got this, I've got a little thing I like to say. Let me, I'll, I'll write it down for you. You might want to write this down. This is pretty complicated. And it, it goes like this. Some will, some won't. So what? Just keep telling the message. And that's what I do. That's my life. I'm, I'm here tonight, and I'm, I'm giving a sermon. I'm giving a message. I'm trying to help you connect with God, and I know what's going to happen tonight. But I just keep coming back. This Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose up from his throne. He laid his robe, robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ash. These people are fearing God. They're afraid of God. I'm not sure why, but they're afraid of God. And I got news for you. You ought to be afraid of God. And I think if I were you, I would chase God until he catches you. Three days journey. How many, uh, he's preaching and preaching. And I, I know that's God's great. God didn't just turn these people into crispy critters. He gave them a ch He gave the whole, here's what I know that's in the belly of the whale. You ready? Love. There's judgment in there. There's repentance in there. There's a second chance for, for, for Jonah. And there's love. For God so loved Nineveh. What did he do? He sent a preacher over there. He loves bad people. Isn't that funny? You know what it says in Romans chapter 5. It says, for a good man, some might die. And for a, you know, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for a, what? I mean... <clears throat> Down to the bottom of the rung. God so loved Nineveh. You know, we get all crazy these days about all the stuff going on in the Middle East and all the people being 
killed over there and murdered. And, and but Did you know that God loves those murderers? It's hard to believe, isn't it? But wait a minute. What's your great sin? We're all in the same boat, man. We can't say to the world, you're into the boat sinking. We're all in it. We're all in it. Verse number 10, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he didn't do it. How about that? So when people change their ways, guess what happens? God takes the heat off. If people don't change their way, God keeps the heat on. And that's nothing but mercy. If he didn't care, he wouldn't care. So, you would think to yourself, wouldn't you, that Jonah's going to go, Woohoo! Boy, we just had a great victory, God. Verse 1 of chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord. Listen to this now. And he said, I pray, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and great kindness and that you repent of evil. So here's Jonah saying, why can't I give you advice? Why won't you listen to my advice? Well, there's a lot of moving parts here. What's going on here? Well, first of all, there's a lesson going on for the people of Nineveh, right? But wait a minute, there's a lesson going on for Jonah. This wasn't all about Nineveh. This was personal. You're not right with God, Jonah. Lord, didn't I have, why did I even have to, you could have done this without me. That's brilliant, isn't it? You know, listen, you may not understand God's ways, but you can always trust his heart. His ways are not your ways. My, my wife and I, we have differences of opinion. No, really. I can put dishes in the dishwasher and she'll come and rearrange them. Huh? You know, I, I was, I was in, uh, taking her somewhere the other day and I was in the lane and I was in the go straight lane and she wanted to know, why aren't you in the turn lane? And I said, well, the reason that I'm not in the turn lane is we don't think alike. <laughs> I... I've been going that way for years, and it works really good for me. And since you're in the car, you can come with me, or you can get out and stand in the turn lane. No, no I didn't do that last part. Not the last part. But I did say we don't think alike. We don't think alike. We just don't think alike. We don't think, and we don't think the way God thinks either. Not even close. Jonah thought he had it figured out. And God said, you got nothing figured out, Jonah. You don't have a clue what I'm doing here. You have no clue. Let's keep reading, find out what is going on. Therefore now, verse 3, O Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Well, then why wasn't he praying that in the belly of the whale? That would have been easy peasy, right? Just stay there and die. Apparently he didn't mean that. Oh, just kill me. I might as well be dead. And God said, you're stupid, Jonah. And the Lord said to Jonah, do you, do you well to be angry? Anybody else in the Bible that, that God said, be careful, you're getting angry? Remember this? Remember what happened? Don't tell me if you think of it. I'm going to tell you. It was Cain and Abel. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Cain did it his own way. And God said, 
no, I'm not accepting your, off, your sacrifice. And he accepted Cain's. And Cain got angry. And God said to Cain, listen to me now. God said, be careful. Sin lies at the door right now. You're about to make a decision. You could go this way or you could go that way. I know you're feeling, but or you could say in your own mind, yes, I get it. I get it. I get what God's doing here, and I'm going to change my ways. Cain said, no, I'm mad, and it was his Abel's fault, so he killed him. You could, uh, and every time you have this angry impulse, you got a decision to make. And God's saying to Ke Jonah, why are you angry? Be careful, Jonah. Are you doing good by being angry? So Jonah went out of the city and he sat in the midst of the city and there he made a booth and he sat under the shadow until it might be, see that, that, that what would become of the city. Is God going to kill these people or not? I'm really PO'd about this. I want them dead. And the Lord prepared. This is the, God keeps preparing stuff just for Jonah. Here's another prepared. God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head and he delivered him from his grief. How about that? So Jonah was exceeding glad for the gourd, but God prepared, here we go again, a worm. When the morning rose the next day and it killed the gourd and it withered. Jonah's going, what? What? He's sitting in the hot sun, and God said, let me make a gourd for you. It'll keep the sun off you. And he went, oh, I feel so much better now. Thank you so much. And God said, now I'm going to make a worm go in there and kill that. Now how do you feel? Now how do you feel? The sun's beaten down. How do you feel now, Jonah? And it came to pass that when the sun did rise, that God prepared. Here we go again. He's working on, he's working on Jonah. Do you think God works on you this way? I know he does. God prepares things in your life, and he does it because he loves you, man. He just loves you too much, too much to let you live the way you do. God prepared a wind a east and the sun beat on the head of Jonah that he fainted and he wished in himself again to die. It's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, you're angry over the gourd? The gourd's dead. He said, I do well to be angry. That's Jonah. Oh, man, you don't fix, shake your fist in God's face. I mean, just, you're going to get your knuckles busted. It just doesn't turn out good. I, of course, yes, I, I, I have a right to be angry. Not with God, you don't. I mean, it just won't turn out good. And God said to Jonah, you do not well to be angry for the gourd. And he said, I do well to be angry. And then said the Lord, verse 10, you, you've had pity on the gourd for which you also didn't labor, neither made it to grow, but it came up in the night and it perished in the night. And should I not have spared Nineveh that great? You're more concerned about the gourd than you are about all these people. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. You're more concerned about the gourd than you are the lives of those people. And by the way, you know what the gourd was, don't you? It was a mushroom. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> what it did was it relieved Jonah's misery for a little while. Should I not have spared Nineveh? No, listen to me now. Listen. What's going on here? Man, this is, I mean, all right, let me tell you what's happening. <clears throat> Jonah changed his ways, but he didn't change his heart. Why? 
why do so many people come and recycle back through and recycle back through and recycle back through because they change their ways but the problem's the heart man the heart's deceitful above all things the bible says and desperately wicked who can know and there's only one way to change your heart god has to do that i was a missionary in portugal and my son was doing drugs over here and my wife wanted me to fly back home and snatch him up and make him change. Well, that's, I can't do that. Any parent ever tried that? Every parent's tried that. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't do anything. Because I know it's not about an outward change. It's got to be inward change. And only God can do that. And that's over my pay grade. So I started talking to the boss and said, I want you to change God's heart. I'm over here during your stuff. Would you mind going over there and helping with mine? I need a little help here. Change my son's heart. And it's got to be from the heart, man, or otherwise it's just a superficial expression that all it does is it make you still, you end up still being self-centered. You're more concerned about a gourd than you are the whole world. Man, that's good preaching. <laughs> so may I suggest this to you? Don't make God put you in the belly of a whale. You might already be there. Maybe that's what's going on here, right? Maybe, uh, Maybe what God's trying to do is to not get you off of your addiction, but maybe what he's trying to do is to reach your heart so you become a new person. Because when you become a new person, things start happening. I mean, things happen around you. Gordon here has got a job in, in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. And he's part of our group out of vocational church. He's been out there a few months now and, and, uh, and God allowed him to get a job up there and he goes up to New Jersey and what happens? God puts somebody in his path that needs help. Oh, you thought it was about the money. No, there's money. They can mail you money, but they can't mail you this guy that needs help. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, man, you, uh, life can get good if you stop thinking about gourds over your head. So it's got to be the inside. Not the outside in, the inside out. And when that happens, God can do something good. And I'm going to read a scripture for you over in Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, listen to this, Hebrews 12. And I alluded to it a minute ago. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you do are in chastening, God deals with you as with sons. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all, then your bastards are not. Wherefore, we have had fathers of our flesh that corrected us. If you have a father that ever corrected, and, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly father, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, you've got to get this, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems joyous, but it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, this is what God's after. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. That's what God's after, man. That's what God's after. He's trying to do something in you that'll turn you into a good person. That makes sense? And why would he do that? Because he loves you. I mean, why does he love you? I don't know. Why does he love me? I don't get it. Why would he do it? I don't know. I just don't know. All I know is he's driven by love. So, we're going to have a prayer like we do every week. And some of you guys have been praying this thing for weeks.
Maybe today's the day it'll take. Who knows? Let's bow our heads. Now, dear God, I pray that you'll bless every person in here. Help them to understand what we're saying today. And I pray that you'll uh, cause every person in here to give you their heart. Now, our prayer goes something like this. But you've got to mean this. This is, this is nothing unless you mean it. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sins. And the best I know how, I accept Jesus as my Savior. I open my heart to you tonight. I need you in my life. I need you in my heart. Tonight I yield myself to you. Tonight I yield myself to you. And tonight I say yes. And tonight I say yes. Instead of no. Instead of no. I pray this in Jesus' name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.